So if you're from Sumter and you come to Camden, there's two things you already know. There's old money over here and you don't speed. So when you eat at a place called Steeplechase Sports Bar and Grill, there's definitely going to be some horse racing on TV. Today's journey brings us to Camden Archives and Museum, 1314 Brawl Street in beautiful downtown Camden. This is a library, uh, mostly older editions of books. And they have a gun display that's on permanent display here. And I think they have a hair comb and hair piece display too. I'm not sure if I'm going to walk back there to that part, but the guns definitely. And after that, we'll walk across the street to the Monument Square. Let's go check out the museum. So we have a cannonball from Fort Sumter. It says this cannonball was given to the Camden library in the 1960s. It was excavated from Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor in 1958. So this top gun, number one, is from the 1400s. There's a revolver gun. It's a dueling set for duels for gentlemen that learn to settle things permanently. A derringer. These are some really early guns. FBI agent Melvin Purvis. G Men. And we're getting into like the Tommy guns and such. I guess these are from like the 20s and 30s maybe. certainly one of the most articulate. He, in turn, gave me my first gun, which is in the museum, but I brought his brother over today. Uh, it's a Thompson submachine gun, and it's on the table here, but this one's kind of unusual. Uh, the one I have in the museum is John Dillon's. I had his hat, his Thompson, and his pistol in the museum. But this particular Thompson, I have a good friend that owns the agency called America Remembers. And they make beautiful weapons for collectible items, and they make a very limited number. They made this weapon that you look at on the table here, and this is serial number two of 300 that they made. And they honored Melvin Purvis and they have John Dillinger and so forth on it. It was interesting that John Dillinger named the machine gun the Chicago typewriter. But before he got a machine gun, John Dillinger had a shotgun cut down this is his sawed-off shotgun, 
And in turn, he had a sense of humor. This gun would probably tear half that wall out over there from here, but he had a front sight put on it like he needed it. <laughs> he, would, he would get up, and if you'll notice, the gun has originally been cut off right here. But when he was trying to hold the gun up and watch the crowd, the gun would droop down. It wouldn't stop. So you had this piece of wood put back on, and he would in turn hold the weapon and jump up on the counters of the bank, and he would he was a brassiest man you've ever seen in your life. He uh, got up on the table on the counter of the bank and he said, if everybody will just stand still and do what you're told, you won't get hurt. And he said, besides that, he said, you will be telling your children and your grandchildren that on this day you were robbed by John Bellin. He'd tell them who he was. It took Melvin Purvis years to figure out why the public would not turn Dillinger in. He was seen at ball games, he would go to restaurants and everything. And what finally kept it off, he was in a restaurant, Mr. Purvis was one night, and Dillinger walked in. And Mr. Purvis said that uh, there was just no way that they could shoot it out in there with him without killing half the people in the restaurant. So he said, I did the next best thing. He said, I psyched him out, said I sent a bottle of champagne over to his table with my business card. And he said Dillinger departed very shortly thereafter. And later, of course, they got him at the Biograph Theater. But when Dillinger, the way he got his machine gun was bad enough, Dillinger read in the paper in Chicago where the police were just sick and tired of being robbers and nobody had turned them in and everything. And they bought new machine guns and bulletproof vests and they were going to stop crime in Chicago. Didn't work out quite that way. Dillinger and his gang went to the police station, held up the police, locked them in their own cell, and took their guns and bulletproof vests. And that didn't go too well. That started crime wave. But with this business with, with uh, the FBI at first, a lot of people don't know this, they could not carry a pistol at first. They could not make an arrest, and they couldn't chase anybody. The only thing they could do was investigate. And one of the funniest stories that Mr. Purvis ever told me was that he visited Al Capone in his hotel suite. They would often visit the gangsters and talk to them. They'd call them on the phone and talk. And in turn, when he was in the room with him, somebody shot through the window. And Mr. Purvis said, you know, it was a rather embarrassing situation. He said, neither of us knew who was being shot at, but we were both returning fire. <laughs> so as we saw in the video a few minutes ago, this is John Dillinger's 1928 model Thompson submachine gun. He called it the Chicago typewriter. This is probably my favorite cabinet. I came back over to this gun cabinet from the World War I, World War II era. The reason I came back is I'm 48 years old and guys my age and a little bit older, their grandfathers had these guns. They bought military surplus and that's what a lot of us guys our age learn to shoot with. If you come to camping, you will definitely see horse racing. Horse racing here goes back generations. All right, we are back outside the museum and that is definitely a great place to spend a few minutes, maybe an hour or so. Uh, the guy's name in there was Todd also, so Jennifer's back there climbing around. But anyway, this was uh, Lawrence Eugene Larry Doby. In uh, 1947, he became the first black baseball player in the American League. So that's definitely worth mentioning. A little bit of history on Camden. It says this area first held by Watery and Catawba Indians was laid out as a Fredericksburg 
Township in 1733. Here on the Catawba Path of the trading town of Pine Tree Hill was settled in 1769. The courts were set up and the town named Camden. In honor of Lord Camden, friend of the colonies during the Revolution, Camden was the center of the British activity in the region. It was incorporated in 1791. Now some of the uh, History I've read on Camden says the Indians were here as early as the 1500s, 1400s, and some of them say even over 2,000 years ago. In 1883, the Ladies Memorial Association of Camden unveiled this monument dedicated to Kershaw County's Confederate war dead. Confederate General John Doby Kennedy of Camden laid the cornerstone with a Masonic trowel once used by Revolutionary War General excuse the noise, De Lafayette to lay the cornerstone of the Baron de Caul monument in 1825. Wade Hampton III, which is who my three great granddaddy fought under, U.S. Senator, former governor of South Carolina, and the general in the Confederate Army delivered the ovation to a crowd of thousands. It says, this monument is erected by the women of Kershaw County in memory of her brave sons who fell during the Confederate War defending the rights and honor of the South. Erected at the intersection of Broad and Lawrence Streets, 1883. All right, that concludes our first of probably many trips over here to Camden to document everything. The library and museum was definitely worth checking out. A uh, guy over there, his name was Todd. Super friendly, super knowledgeable of the area. We went across the street to uh, Monument Square. Didn't realize there were multiple squares in the square. So anyway, we'll check out more of that next time. And so we're ending um, where we had our first date. And we're having a latte at Books on Broad. So anyway, make sure you give us a thumbs up, leave us some comments, and uh, we'll get better at this filming stuff. <laughs> But uh, also make sure you subscribe and uh, thanks for watching.